presence in this world. We thank you for your presence in this room. It's because of your presence that we have the power to lift our heads today. It's because of your presence that we have the power to endure anything that comes our way. Knowing we don't fight in vain. Knowing we don't fight alone. Yes, Lord, we have supernatural power on our side. And because of that power, we're able to be all that you made us to be. So, God, I ask right now that you bless this word. I ask right now that you bless us who hear it. And I ask right now that you bless the one that speaks it. Keep us, Lord, and we shall be kept in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here today. Um, last year, I asked God to give me more opportunities to preach. Um, they say you should be specific with your prayers. And I was. I wrote it down. I almost tattooed it on my arm. I said, Lord, just give me the opportunity to, 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 to show the difference you've made in my life. And God said, okay, okay, you have the opportunity. But the thing is, you have to live every sermon you preach. And that comes the responsibility. Then comes the opportunity to fully be who God made you to be. And so if you're asking God to bless you, then you're also asking God to use you. If you're asking God to uplift you, you're also asking God to break you. And as we know, when you break a bone, it becomes stronger when it heals. So after you've healed, then you can be all God made you to be. Don't discount your pain because every tear you've shed has not been in vain. Every tear you've shed has been numbered. God has counted those numbers and God will restore everything you've lost. Not only what you've lost, but God will restore everything you have willfully given to the enemy. There's more to be said. There's more to be shown. There's more to be shared. And I'm able and willing to do that. Amen. I want to call your attention this afternoon to the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter. And I want to center on verses 21 through 27. And they read, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. For the, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you to pray with me this afternoon as I deliver a message entitled, If It's Magic. Um, since God has blessed me with different opportunities to preach, I needed uh, material. And I wanted to do something a little bit different throughout this year. Um, so I took a classic album by Stevie Wonder called Songs in the Key of Life. And God has allowed me to develop different sermons based on the 21 titles of, those, of that album. I haven't, I haven't written 21 sermons on the thing yet. I'm up to sermon seven, but y'all, y'all pray with me. I'm going to 21. And uh, I, I live like three blocks from the Motown Museum. So it's like either I was going to write about the church or Stevie Wonder or Stevie Wonder in the church. And that's just, that was just was it. So, um, so If It's Magic is a wonderful track from that album. And I want to put a tag on that text um, when God is the problem and the solution. 
Amen. I remember driving my car during one of our historic Michigan winters, and it's absolutely cold in Detroit in the winter. And I was a young driver. I was just turned 16, and my parents warned me to slow down. But in my teenage arrogance, I didn't listen. Matter of fact, I paid them no mind at all. Oh, I had my hands on 10 and 2 when my parents were near the car. But once they turned their backs, it was just like that. <laughs> and I was cruising down Michigan Avenue, and you couldn't tell me a thing. My parents couldn't tell me a thing. Matter of fact, when they were young, they didn't even have cassette players or CDs in that car. They had to ride around all day listening to an eight track until that song came back on the radio. They had no idea what they were talking about. They honestly had no clue what traction control was. That wasn't even a figment of their imagination in their youth. They couldn't tell me a thing. I thought I could navigate the snow and I was doing pretty well until I miscalculated. And against my better judgment, I drifted into a snowbank. Whether I wanted to believe it or not, I was stuck. And have you ever been stuck? Against your better judgment, you found yourself in a situation and merely found yourself in a bind that was out of your control, stuck, couldn't get out of it, you could only endure it, stuck, and your life becomes full. Mornings are tearful, a career is uneventful, and relationships are awful. You are just stuck. Well, if you've ever been in that situation, then you understand the dilemma of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Jesus had relationship with them. More than that, he loved them. Yes, he spent time with them. He nurtured them. And the narrative explains the severity of Lazarus's illness. In great detail, it explains that, that Martha sent word to Jesus in Jerusalem that their brother was sick. Their brother, the one Jesus loved, was severely ill. And it goes on to say that upon hearing the news, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. And it really appears that he left Lazarus stuck. Yes, he left Lazarus stuck in his own mortality. He was stuck in a life-threatening illness, stuck. And logic begins to creep in. As we read this passage, we learn that Jesus did not move. Jesus may have known, but Jesus did not move. And as logic begins to creep in, we understand that either Jesus did not know or Jesus did not care. And I know you've been there. You've been in situations where you have felt the pain of life meet you head on and you wonder if God even knows. You wonder if God can move. You wonder if God even cares. In short order, we can see that Christ is slow to move, and the magical life of being a Christian is suddenly altered. It was wonderful when you were being blessed with new cars and a new home. It was wonderful. But then life calls your name, and you start to sing a different tune. If it's magic... Why can it be everlasting like the sun that always shines, like a poet's endless rhyme? And you wonder that age old question why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, you're not perfect people, but you understand you shouldn't be catching all of this misery. You've not been perfect, but you've certainly been good enough. 
to outlast some of this misery that's coming your way. You've lost so many things. You've caught so many losses and you can't even count them all. And then we learn that life is no fairy tale. We learn that we all struggle in different ways, that struggle is a form of education, primarily because we learn that our personalities don't prevent us from pain. Mary and Martha wept bitter tears over the body of their brother Lazarus, and their affinity to Christ did not, cannot, and will not impede the inescapable component of struggle in our lives. Oh, you can look as pretty as you want to, but you are going to struggle some days in this world. You can have a Bible as large as this room, and you are going to struggle some days in this world. You wonder why. Why does God allow nine believers in Charleston, South Carolina, to be shot down at Mother Emanuel? Well, why? In the latest episode of gun violence, allow parishioners to be slain in a California synagogue. I pray all the time. I'm a chaplain at two hospitals and an associate minister at a mega church. I pray all the time. I'm paid to pray. People call me and they ask me to pray. They text me and ask me to pray. They email me and they send smoke signals and say pray. I pray all the time. And I haven't cried while I prayed in a long time, but I did yesterday. I wept at the tragic loss of life. I wept at the lack of humanity. I wept at the lack of compassion. And it really doesn't matter if we have differing faiths. I wept for the Muslims after the mosque was shot. I wept for the Jews after the synagogue was assaulted. I wept for the three African-American churches in Louisiana that were burned to the ground. There are many tears to go around. And it really doesn't matter that we have differing faiths. I wept that someone could be fueled by xenophobia and ignorance enough to think that they had the authority to take lives they didn't give. That's worthy of tears. That's worthy of us pausing just to remember the lives that were here, those that will never grow, those that will never fulfill the earthly dreams that their parents had for them. And there are times like these when I really don't understand God. No matter how much I pray, no matter how, how much I read, I really don't get it. I don't understand how God could allow innocent lives to be taken. And suddenly I find camaraderie with Mary and Martha. They pleaded with Christ and they shared their anger with him. How do you appeal to God about God? I know how to address church folk being church folk. That's easy. I know how to address those who are mired in blatant sexism from the pulpit or have narrow mindedness in Bible study. That's easy. But how do I address my disappointment, my utter anger with a God who allows a downfall to the upright? How do I address my anger when bad things continually happen to God's people? And the bright side of this dilemma is that God can handle my frustration. Yes, the humanity of Christ is apparent in the Gospel of John. In fact, this gospel makes it abundantly clear that we can't know Jesus outside of his humanity and we can't fully appreciate God unless we share our humanity. That's the part of him that easily connects to us. 
So I'm encouraging you today to share everything with God. Share everything in your mind with the God of your salvation. Don't hide anything. Don't hold anything back. You have a church face that you put on when you come to church on Sunday morning, but share everything with God. The emotions you can't understand and the fears you attempt to hide, share everything with God. What you attempt to hold back behind your persona or your occupation or even behind a preacher's robe. Yes, we're human too. People come to us for prayer and people come to us for understanding, but who do we go to? And far too often we go to each other and the hurting can't help the hurting. It's only one who has been healed who can help everybody. And so I go to God with my frustrations and with my burdens. I go to God in prayer. I go to God in worship. And sometimes you worship through tears. You don't always have to worship God with a smile on your face. Sometimes you worship God while gritting your teeth. Sometimes you worship God while lamenting. You worship God while saying, Lord, why have you allowed this to happen? Now, remember, I was reading a book by Howard Thurman. And I'm not going to lie to you. I can't understand all Howard Thurman. <laughs> Howard Thurman probably couldn't understand all Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was so deep. Howard Thurman was so deep that this man, honestly, he said, he said, um, he said there's a difference between a, 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 a a, um, and an exclamation point and a question mark. Yes, there's a difference between an exclamation point and a question mark. And the only difference between an exclamation point and a question mark is that an exclamation point is a question mark that's been wrestled with. The only difference between an exclamation point and a question mark is that the, the exclamation point is a question mark that has been wrestled with. There are going to be some questions that come to you in this life and you're just going to have to keep wrestling with them. There are some questions that come to you and you're going to have to read through it and you're going to have to sing through it and you're going to have to work through it and you're going to have to wait in it. And you can't just wish it away. You can't just work it away. You can't spend it away. You can't give it away. You can't do anything but meet the problem that God has handpicked for you. Yeah, there are some dilemmas that leave you blinded. There are some dilemmas that leave you dizzy. There are some dilemmas that are absolutely going to knock you flat on your back. You're not flat on your back, but you're blessed. You're bewildered, but you're blessed. You're questioning, but you're blessed. The fact that you're still questioning after you've experienced life says that you have a mind. And if you have a mind, then you should use your mind. You, you have a, a, a sense of humor. And you didn't create your own sense of humor. God gave that to you. God gave you your intellect. God gave you every gift you have. So if God gave you the gift, why wouldn't God want you to use the gift? You have a mind, then you should think. You have a sense of humor, then you should laugh. And both have their value. For if life was all laughter and no seriousness, you'd never get anything done. And if life was all seriousness and no laughter, you would buckle under the weight of your own intellect. So we need balance. And in this exchange with Martha, following the death of Lazarus, we see that Jesus expresses his grief. He wasn't afraid to sit with his grief. The Gospel of John humanizes Jesus. It allows us to see and touch him and we can see his grief. We can see his grief and we can see him sitting in his grief. Just like Job did, he sat in his grief. 
Well, in the New Testament, Jesus sits in his grief and he expresses his grief with his tears. He wasn't afraid to sit with his grief because there are some things you just have to sit through. And I believe that Jesus continues to grieve the recklessness disguised as humanity today. God has experience in interpreting teardrops and reading the stories of our lives. And those stories have characters. There are some characters in this story, and I think you can find yourself in the midst of some of these characters. Martha is a character. Martha is a worker. She exemplifies the works that are necessary to make faith real. Commentaries have identified Mary as exhibiting true faith, faith that would not shrink. The adoration of God in the midst of chaos, Mary was a character. You have some workers in the church, those who pound the pavement, those who move the muscle, those who do everything that's necessary to move the church from where it ought to be, to wh from where it is to where it ought to be. And then you have some faith workers, those who wear bonnets on their head, and those who, who walk around and, and chant, those who pray all day and all night. We need some faith workers in the church. We need some faith workers in the church that have a purse full of hard candy and will absolutely give you some, some candy when you need it and say, go, baby, just, just, just do what you have to do. You have five lines to remember in an Easter play, and you, you forget three of them, and they just say, take your time, baby. <laughs> and in the back of the church, you some people saying, you don't take your time, take your seat. <laughs> <laughs> and whether you are Mary or Martha, neither one of these people and neither one of their traits could console us from the outside looking in. It's only when we examine this story from the inside out that we see it and everything else differently. In verse 4, Jesus says that this sickness would not end in death. He doesn't speak these words to Mary and Martha, but he says those things to himself. So the question then becomes, how will we respond when God doesn't speak to our fears or reply in, to our haste, but uses our pain to work God's plan? The pain was the loss of a loved one, but the plan was for others to bear witness to the strength of Christ as a result of Lazarus's resuscitation. Jesus was about to perform a spectacle and a miracle and extract grief or extract glory from grief to save a life. However, that story isn't about the acts of Christ. That story isn't about the works of God as much as it's about the unflinching trust that's required of God's servant. Yes, God doesn't want you to get sidetracked on the miracles, but God wants you to become engulfed in the pertinent. God wants you to become engulfed in what's required of you day to day. Some of us live from miracle to miracle, but God wants you to maximize moment to moment. Some of those moments are filled with grief. And some of those moments are filled with questions. And some of those moments are filled with things you could not possibly understand. You think you're enveloped in grief. But God wants you to know that you're comforted in glory. And that doesn't disguise the pain that you're going through. You know, I always wanted children. I love kids. Love them dearly, don't have any. I help people who have lost their children at the hospital. Mothers who are grieving, I help them and I console them. And I use the pain that I went through when I lost my children to help them with theirs, right? You think the pain can take you out. 
And there are some sadnesses in this world that can absolutely push you to the brink of death. When you lose your parents, when you lose your wife or spouse, and you think everything stops, and for a moment it does. Yes, you are locked into grief, but God comes with a key that, uh, that can uncage you. I thought my entire world would end when I lost my wife. I counsel people that are going through divorce now. But when I went through divorce back in 2010, I thought that was it. I wasn't going to see 2011. I knew that that just was it. And grief is real, but grief is a camouflage. It's a camouflage because it makes you think that all you see is all there is. But God, through this story, allows me to understand that there is a tomorrow. That there is a tomorrow that is not just a continuation of today. That God can show you a new thing tomorrow. God can bring about a new dream tomorrow. That doesn't stop the hurt that you've been through. But that doesn't say, that also says rather that you are going through. You're working through. You're living through. Because God is bringing you through. It asks us, do we have the capacity to trust God? I understand you can trust God when everything is going smoothly. But can you trust God when you are at your wit's end? I know that you can trust God when you have money in the bank and friends downtown at a healthy reputation, but can you trust God when all you have is the promise that God made declaring God's everlasting presence in your life? Can you trust God when you think you are absolutely alone? Far away from everything and everyone, can you trust God then? In the unfamiliar territory, can you trust God? Can you rely on a God that you can't see to deal with problems that you can see? Can you rely on God to do for you what you can't do for yourself? In this instance, God is saying, I may take you through what appears to be a death. And you might lose your reputation. You might be stretched to the limits of your comfort zone. But I have not left you to death as much as I brought you through it. Jesus wasn't phased by physical death because he knew there was something better on the other side of it. That allows me to raise my hands. Jesus understood that there's more to this life than what you see. Your feelings are absolutely real, but there's more to life than your feelings. Your feelings can change when the wind blows, but there's more to life than what you're going through. That doesn't discount your pain. That doesn't discount your loss. But that says that there's more to life than what you're going through. There's what we are going to. And there's a God that's bringing us through. I believe in my soul that Jesus knew that life contains the physical, but isn't limited to it. The quality of our soul is paramount. So he provides a way to deal with life in the midst of death. The subject was death. But the message was life. The subject is unavoidable, but the message is unmistakable. Don't lose the message in the midst of the subject. All of us have to deal with the subject. But the blessed of us have the message in the midst of the subject. So it doesn't mean that you won't be upset. But it absolutely means that you must keep your faith. It doesn't shield you from tragedy, but it keeps you through it and it delivers you safely past it. How do I know? Because God has a track record of keeping me and keeping you through dangers seen and unseen. And the question is whether I can trust the God I can't trace or whether I believe in a God that I can't always understand. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. 
I might lose my life, but it will never lose its power. I may lose my money, but it will never lose its power. I may lose what I think I need to survive, but it will never lose its power. How do I know? Because I've been Lazarus. I faced some situations that have absolutely killed me. And I come back again. I faced some situations that have allowed me to shed bitter tears, but I come back again. I faced situations that would have killed some and would have destroyed others and would have disgraced others. And I've come back again and again and again and again. God has allowed us to turn the days into weeks, turn the weeks into months. And even when it doesn't appear that every day looks good for you, God will bring out the best in you. God will reach down and work out what doctors can't figure out. God will allow us to come back again and again through danger seen and unseen. God will allow us to connect broken pieces and God will allow us to replace broken circumstances and God will allow us to become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's a promise from the heart of God to yours to keep you in sickness and shelter you during the storm. Yes, God keeps God's promises and God keeps God's people. And that's a reason to remain righteous. That's a reason to lift your hands and give God praise. Because others who were in your situation would have taken themselves out years ago. You're stronger than you think. You're stronger than situations that were sent to break you. You're stronger than all you have gone through. And that gives you reason to give God praise. In this scripture, we see the miraculous power of God coupled with the compassionate care of God. Yes, the Lord weeps at the destruction that's often committed in God's name. The Lord weeps at the patriarchal sexism that forces women to be silent and ushers them to the figurative recesses of the church. The Lord weeps when we allow a woman to make Sunday dinner, but not serve the Lord's supper. And the Lord continually weeps. The Lord weeps at the lack of humanity in the face of homelessness and intolerance of those who are different. The Lord meets those tragedies with tears, but he doesn't stop there. He hears the valid fears of his servants, but he doesn't stop there. He greets our human frailty with his divine power, and he leaves us better than we came. The Lord doesn't just grieve with you, but the Lord helps you. But let me get back to my story when I was a young driver, and I veered off the road into that snowbank. And the day seemed to be dark. Absolutely, the day was cold and the day was dreary and the day was dark and I thought life was gone because I had wrecked a car that I didn't own. <laughs> and I had to go back home to my parents who told me to slow down and I was, it was just all bad for me. I was 16 and I never thought I would see 17. And I'm 43, hallelujah, and I never thought I'd see it. <laughs> I was there, I was in that snowbank, right, for like five minutes. And five minutes in a cold Michigan snowbank seems like an hour. And cars whizzed by me and wouldn't stop. Cars saw me sitting there in that snowbank, and they did not stop. Trucks passed me and just blew the horn. I said, what? Cars passed me. People on bicycles passed me. And they would not stop. And it was before the rise of cell phones, so I was just stuck and cold and lonely. And then an old steady tow truck came my way. I passed them about a half mile back. 
and he saw me, but I didn't see him. Yes, there are some things that see you and you don't see them. And the driver of that snow truck or that tow truck said to himself, that man is going to crash pretty soon. And when he does, I'll be there to help him out. And the driver slowed down and hooked up his tool to my axle and did for me what I couldn't do for myself. You never realize how fragmented you were until you've been made whole. And you never know that you've been lost until you've been found again. And he reached down and he grabbed me out of my situation and helped me to get on my way with no charge. And a matter of fact, see, this is when the story gets real, real good. Because the driver of the tow truck was my father's large brother. And he broke the news to my father before I did. And that's why I'm able to see 43. Hallelujah. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you've been. It matters who saw you when you didn't see them. And as sure as I'm standing here, God saw you. God saw you face tragedy and God saw you beat it before you did. God saw you face heartache and God saw you beat it before you did. God saw you down and God saw you lifting up before you did. And so all I want you to do today is to be honest with the God who saw you before you could see yourself. And because God saw you and some things in you before you could see yourself, then that gives God the power to do with you what you can't do for yourself. And you can leave better than you came in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Just thank God for that word. Thank God that we are able to leave better than what we came. And Reggie, you don't even know you were all up on where we've just been, like as a church, um, and, and that resurrection power and, and walking in it day in and day out, like no matter what, not even looking for the miracles, but just every day, y'all, connecting with God on that level. Can we just stand to our feet? Can we stand to our feet? And if you could just close your eyes for a minute and just take a moment to reflect on what you've heard in this word and what God is speaking directly to you. God can handle our questions. God can handle our fears. God can take us through. God, we thank you for the gift of your word. God, we thank you that we can come to you with everything that's on our heart, everything that's on our minds, God, everything that we don't want to share with anybody else, even the ugly stuff, God, the stuff we don't want anybody to know about, God. We thank you that we can come to you just as we are and you still love us, God, just as we are. God, we thank you for the ability to grieve with us, God. We thank you for the humanity of your son, Jesus. Remind us, God, to just connect connect, oh God, to walk with Christ day in and day out, oh God, to be connected, oh God, to the resurrection power, oh God, and understanding that some of the things we may lose, some of the things that may hurt today, oh God, they can be revived tomorrow, oh God. They can be revived next week, oh God. They can be revived because you are the resurrecting God. You are a living God. You are a loving God. You are a keeping God. So God, we even today thank you for the struggles, oh God. We thank you for some of the pain that we've had to endure 
endure because it was in that pain and through those struggles that we came to know you for ourselves, oh God. We came to know you as the God that can comfort. We came to know you, oh God, as the God that can keep, oh God. So remind us who you are, oh God, in our lives. Remind us, oh God, when we forget, oh God, when we're in those dry places. Remind us, oh God, that you're right there walking with us and talking with us, God, and holding our hand, oh God. Allow us to see past our situations, oh God. Allow us to see past even our feelings, oh God, and to tap into the faith, oh God, as your children, as your believers, as those who are one with you. God, we don't want to just live this life in a natural experience, oh God, but we want to experience you and your fullness and your abundance, oh God. Even when we're stuck in our snow banks, oh God, remind us that you still have your eyes on us. Remind us, oh God, that your help is coming, oh God. Remind us, oh God, that your hand is over us. Remind us, oh God, of the cloud of witnesses that surround us, oh God, to minister to us, oh God, and to keep us. God, remind us. Even in those dry places of how much you love us, remind us of every miracle, oh God, that you've done, but also remind us, oh God, that if you chose not to do a miracle, you love us no less. So help us to hold on to our faith, oh God. Help us to increase our faith, oh God, to tap into our faith, oh God, as believers, oh God. God, just help us to be in community with one another, oh God, to share our gifts, oh God, to just do what you would have us to do, God. God, we thank you for the word, and we thank you that even after this moment, after we leave this place, that your word would continue to sit on our hearts, oh God, and to speak to our spirits, that we can be drawn on unto you, God, and become more like Christ. God, we want to be like you. We want to be faithful, God. Even when we have to weep, God, we want to keep the faith. So, God, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.